Well, good evening. Uh, good afternoon, I should say. Want to uh, talk to y'all about Secure Electronic Commerce or Security Com? What is Security Commerce? Well, it first started in the mid 90s when we had the dot com boom. And everyone wanted to be able to sell, buy things over the internet. Uh, right after the dot com era ended around the beginning of the turn of the century, we started getting that dot com is really not the way you want to go. You don't want to start selling in e commerce. But after about 2003, Amazon and these type of uh, companies came out, and really, eBay. PayPal, they all really started booming the electronic commerce. Sales and profit growth returned, and we've been on a steady rocket ever since. Then we had our um, our big hit in 2008 with the economic environment collapsing on us because of the housing market and fuel economies. And when that occurred, even e-commerce got hit, but it didn't get hit as bad as what your normal everyday store-bought things would be because you don't you're not spending as much fuel to get it there um, now shipping prices went up a little bit but that's really where the uh, difference is what is electronic commerce well by definition uh, electronic commerce is any any business activity that uses internet technologies World Wide Web um, if you're doing Square, you're doing Intuit from your mobile phones. Any type of electronic transfer of resources from one to another is called e-commerce. Well, you're going to see it shopping on the web such as Amazon or eBay. Businesses trading with other businesses is what we call the B2B approach. You have the internal company processes. And then we have electronic business. What is the terms or the the processes in which we do well we have what we call b2c or the consumer shopping on the web business to consumer that means the business is providing a resource to the consumer then we have b2b e-procurement you probably heard pro about procurement for, especially in the military side where they procure assets and things to help um, work on military equipment basically that is transactions from business to business on a bigger scale, you have Walmart buying from the independent distributors. So then they take them to the distribution center and then distribute them out to their warehouses. That's business to business type environment. Then what is the business process? Well, it's using the internet technology to support this type of selling. Now, well, you think about it, but what is C to C or consumer to consumer? Where do, you, where do we get that? Well, a consumer to consumer is going to be more like your direct sales where you have someone that has consumed the product is also reconsuming it back out to someone else, maybe a used car dealer, um, even though they're more of a business to consumer. Then you have business to government, where you actually have businesses selling to the government for better profits. So here's the different types of e-commerce. You're going to have your business to business, and then you're going to have your business to consumer, but it's all as high encompassing of the business process of e-commerce. The elements of e-commerce. You have relative sizes of elements, your C to C, your B to C, things of that na nature. Then you have your, da uh, your dollar volume. Of course, business to business would be much greater than business to consumer because the consumer doesn't have the billions of dollars to go trading with another business. So, therefore, you're gonna, your businesses to businesses are going to be a lot bigger. Your number of transactions are going to be supporting businesses. Processes are greater than, than uh, business to consumer and business to business combined. So those are your elements. You're going to have the size of the transaction, the uh, dollar amount, and the number of those transactions. When we're talking about the res uh, relevant sizes, for example, you're not, you may buy a case of water for yourself, but you're not going to buy a pallet of water for yourself. It's where a business would buy a pallet of water because they have a lot bigger scale of what they need to produce. There's categories of electronic commerce. Well, what is a category? Well, in order to have a categories, we have an activity. An activity is what is performed by a worker while they're doing their job. Simply put, 
whatever I'm doing, that's an activity. Then you have to have a transaction, an exchange of something, money for an object, okay, a purchase, a sale, a converse, uh, conversion of raw materials into finished product. You have to have an activity to produce the transaction. And then you have the business process, which is the group of logical related or sequential activities and transactions grouped together. So you have to have the activity to perform a transaction, but the two of them together is part of the business process. Well, what happens, that's our normal environment of commerce, but when we put it into a web-based system, now we're talking about electronic commerce, where web, in the web, uh, it helps make the people work more effectively because there's a lot less paperwork, there's a lot less um, It just becomes less hassle, per se. One, one aspect of this is telecommuting. You have your individual that doesn't have to get in their car and drive all the way to work, and then they have to keep the building going so that these people don't have to worry about it, and then they can come back and sit at their house and, and, and relax. Okay, That's telecommuting. What about consumer to consumer? Well, if, if we're buying and selling amongst ourselves, i.e. eBay, Okay, that is where, or Craigslist or something of that nature, where you have something that you're trying to sell. I'm not a business, I'm going to do a garage sale. That's a consumer to consumer. Uh, all consumer to consumer sales are included in a business to consumer category. Why? Because the seller acts as a business, all right, for a transactional purpose only. Not that they are a physically a 501c3 type business or if they're a actual LLC or incorporated business. They may be, there, like myself, if I'm doing a yard sale, I'm not going to make myself an LLC just for this yard sale. But I'm still considered a seller, so it's more of a business-to-consumer rather than a consumer-to-consumer. -consumer. A business-to-government, basically, that's going to be your tra transactions with any government agency, whether it's IRS, um, Department of Homeland Security, DHS, it doesn't matter. Uh, the VA, that's all government-based. So any uh, transactions that the businesses are doing with the federal government is called B to G. And here's some categories like we talked about the B to C, B to B, C to C, and B to G um, in the definition of business processes. All right. Well, how did it, how do we grow e-commerce? Well, you've got to be engaged in those people that are engaged in commerce, which is everybody. If you've ever bought, sold, thought about buying something, you're engaged in commerce. We have to put those tools for them to be able to do commerce in front of them. Well, what's the easy way to do this? The internet. Everyone's pretty much on it nowadays. Uh, I believe the last time I saw 85% of the United States was on the internet in some in some form. And I think that 15% is probably those uh, in the upper generationals, you know, your grandparents type generation where they didn't grow up with technology. They didn't grow up around this, so they don't really have an understanding of the electronic commerce or the internet for that matter. They can barely, uh, they can read an email, but they wouldn't know how to get to it if you ask them. The internet changed the way that people buy, sell, hire, organize, and do a lot of things in order to transa uh, have transactions. For example, how many of you have had paychecks that are electronically deposited? That's what we call an EFT. Instead of giving you the paper copy and you having to take it to the bank and it would take three days for it to clear, it automatically is in your account the day of that you're supposed to get paid and you have the money that Friday when you shouldn't have had it until used to, you wouldn't have it until the Monday or Tuesday following. So that's what EFT is for, wire transfers, you know, those, those type of processes. Later on, we're going to talk about what we call the EDI or the electronic data interchange, which is the business-to-business -business transmission. It it uh, puts everything in a readable format so they can be transmitted across the networks. Standard transmitting formats benefits because it reduces your errors, it reduces overhead, it avoids printing and mailing costs, and eliminates the need to re-enter the information over and over and over. Trading partners. What are your trading partners? Business engaged with EDI, which is electronic data interchange, they talk to each other, i.e., Walmart is talking to their direct supplier of auto parts. 
to go to Fram. They say, okay, we sold X amount of Fram auto filters. We need uh, a pallet full of these Fram auto filters so we can send them out to the specific stores. And then that it would automatically do that as soon as it's scanned at the register. It goes out to Bentonville. Bentonville has this huge database that takes the information, and says, "Here's what we need to order." Sends it to the the uh, suppliers. The suppliers say, "Okay, we need to sit, uh, send X amount of things to Walmart." Walmart, Sears, and GE were the three big pioneers of this data interchange between the supplier and the consumer. The problem that they found was it was very high cost because of the computer hardware and software, the direct network cablings that they had to get to um, those individual suppliers. And then they added what they call a value-added network. So basically it became an independent operator that was doing all this and getting all these information from the big uh, box retailers and sending them out to the suppliers. The suppliers got the information. and. There was a secured environment that no one could break. Everyone was using this one uh, EDI office. And they were charged on a monthly fee per, or plus a per transaction charge. So let's just say they were charged $10,000 a month and 25% or 25 cents per transaction. That Anytime they said, hey, we need this, okay, I'll, I'll send it over there, but it's going to cost you 25 cents. So if you can imagine for each different type of item that they're having to go to each of these different suppliers for, that adds up pretty quick when you're doing it on a daily basis. Gradually moved EDI, EDI to the internet, so therefore they're skipping that middleman. They're going directly to the supplier, so the supplier is hooked up to the Walmart database saying, okay, we need to shift them so many because they only have so many on, on stock if they're at this particular distribution center, so we'll send it to this distribution center, and then they've got them regionalized and compartmentalized and things of that nature now. In 1997, the EDI first came out, uh, or I'm sorry, the dot-com started. There were 12,000 internet-related businesses, $100 billion in investors, and then by the end of it, 5,000 companies went out of business or were acquired by another business. From 2000 to 2003, 200 billion. In other words, double the amount of investment. It fueled a, a new boom area, if you want, and eBay, Amazon, they really started coming up in having more of a hold of the e-commerce. Then you have the 2008-2009 recession. Even though the growth rates were continuing to increase, the uh, amount of sales were decreasing, but people were keeping it up because the internet access was increasing the, the better bandwidth. So as you can see, they're estimating $9.5 trillion in sales by the year 2011. Well, I haven't looked it up lately to see exactly what it was, but that that's uh, what they were estimating is the inc uh, the total increase. The second wave of electronic commerce. Remember, back in the Industrial Revolution, they had four different they had four waves. The first and second wave characteristics were that you had it in a regional scope. Okay, the first wave of the regional scope was the United States. It was Everything was lo local to the United States, and then the second wave, it went international. The startup capital was very easy to obtain, until, and then by the second wave, the companies were doing it themselves. When internet technologies were used, at first it was very slow uh, and inexpensive. Now it's based on broadband connections, and you're just going everywhere. So, I mean, as you can see, the huge different characteristics between the first and the second. Internet technology integration, the first wave, we used barcodes and scanners. Now we're using RFIDs for inventories when we're, you'll have a forklift driving in and read off all those RFIDs of each different product that's in there, calculate it and add it to their inventory automatically. Smart cards, biometrics, we're using more of the new t technologies and tools. Email, at first it was not really used that much, um, it was here nor there. Second wave, now you have to have it becoming contra uh, contracts are based on emails now. So that's where you market it and get contract strategies. Revenue source. At first, you had to have some sort of online advertisement. Now it, it's really booming because now they can target each individual user with the cookies. Y'all are familiar with cookies. We'll talk a little bit about them later on. Digital product sales. At first, you, you just had a lot of 
it wasn't very successful with the music industry because we had all those peer-to-peer -peer networks that were sharing and all that. Now the second wave, now that with the new DRM uh, security mechanism on them, it makes it a little bit harder for someone to copy and steal the data. Mobile t uh, telephone uh, based commerce was coming, or M commerce, smartphone technology, Web 2.0. I mean, it's really enhancing the capabilities of the corporation. The business online strategies. First, it was whoever was the first one in that area was the the epitome of it. The second wave, it doesn't really uh, matter who was the first one in there. If I can do it better than you, I'm going to beat you out. So these are some of the different types of characteristics that uh, you will see of the first and second wave. So how does it? How do you have to be successful? Well, you have to have a good business model, and the business model is basically your goals that you want to achieve from yielding profit. I mean, that that's really what it amounts to. E-commerce first wave, the investors sought internet-driven business models to help them recur their their money that they were going to put in. They uh, wanted to make sure what they saw in the successful dot-com companies, they used those type of business models. Um, however, Michael Porter argued that there was not really a business model for the dot-com boom. They'd never seen it before. It was something new. So it's something that they have to uh, work on. Instead of, copying, instead of copying the model, they looked at Facebook and Google. What did Facebook and Google do? Well, they streamlined, they enhanced, they replaced internet technology driven with, or replaced them with internet technology driven processes. Therefore, it was speeding up the amount of processes that needed to be, making them better and more easily used. The revenue model today um, is the new model that they talk about. It's a specific collection of business processes where you identify the customer, you market that customer, and you generate the sales. Like I talked about, the targeted marketing, that's the new revenue model. That's why you see specific ads from cookies that, let's say you went to rose.edu. Well, you're going to get rose.edu marketing all over your Google site now because you've gone to Rose. Companies think in terms of business processes. They talk about purchasing raw materials, goods for resale, converting those materials, managing, hiring, and finances, right? That, that's, that's what businesses think about. Well, what do we need to do? We need to identify the processes that can benefit from those e-commerce technologies. So if you put sp specific information in an internet environment, how are you going to be able to focus or use those existing business processes to identify and acquire new business opportunities and then adapt to the changes if you need to. So what have they done? Well, they looked at it and said, okay, we have merchandising. We've gone from our marketing. Now, how are we going to uh, lay out our store to where it's going to capture the most attention as uh, needed? Now, how many times do y'all go go to Walmart or whatever and they have all these candies right there at the end of the counter where you're checking out that's merchandising those are those oh I've got to have this type marketing then you have salespeople skills you go to those stores where like a car dealership where you have the most annoying person coming up to you and trying to say, find everything they can to help you get your need and get what you want so they can put money in their pocket type of person so the the difference between merchandising and personal selling is you don't get that without being there and doing it. Now, with the web sales, it's a lot easier to do because I can sit there and spend hours looking at something and making a decision without being bothered by someone whether I'm going to uh, buy something or not. Now, it's easier for some, uh, some products to be on the web than others. You know, I mean, you sit there and you talk about what what type of stuff are going to be well suited and what stuff will not be well suited. Well, you're, are you going to sell candy bars on the internet? Probably not, because by the time it's sold and shipped, there's that days delay. You're not going to sell milk. You're not going to sell um, 
butter. You're not going to sell that kind of stuff on there unless you're in the newer, bigger markets where they're doing grocery store shopping for you and you can get it within an hour or so. Commodity items, well suited to the e-commerce uh, selling. In other words, your, your products that are hard to distinguish from the same products or services being provided by other sellers. It, it, the features that they're standardized and well-known. But the price is what's going to drive your sell, whether you're going to go to the cheaper one or you're going to go to the more expensive one. Product shipping profile. Do you want you want something that has a light weight, so it's more money for you on the shipping charges? DVD is a good example. Expensive jewelry. Do you have a high value to weight? So those would be the good types of shipping for you. Easier to sell products. Strong brand, uh, brand reputation. Like, for example, Kodak. However, Kodak has gone out of business now, so it's not really Kodak. It would be Fujifilm or Sony or uh, Nikon, uh, those type of uh, camera systems now. But you want to appeal to a small geographic diverse group. Traditional commerce, they relied on the individual selling skills in order to sell a product. Now, the products should have to be able to sell themselves. So that's where, which type of market do you want to go to? E-commerce increases sales and decreases cost. The virtual community is gathering uh, online more and more. We have the generation now that has just grown up around computers. And e-commerce buyer opportunities. The more websites, the more chances I have to buy what I need to buy, the better off I'm going to be. Web 2.0 is basically the term given to describe a second generation of the World Wide Web that is focused on the ability of people to collaborate and share information online. More of what we call the SOA environment. Um, shared online access. So that people can give the information. How many of you have heard of SharePoint? How many of you, you know, uh, Google Drive or SkyDrive or uh, OneDrive from Microsoft? More the cloud-based sharing uh, formats. That's that's what Web, uh, Web 2.0 is all about. Today, Web 2.0 has shown a light on a major issue affecting uh, people today. The first issue was reported on Google+. Plus. Think about that. When we talk about Google+, Plus, we have Google Drive, right? You've got Google Apps, where everything is cloud-driven. We have the benefits to extend uh, general society welfare because everything is lower cost to issue secure electronic payments, public retirement, welfare support. Everything is electronic based now. Provides faster transmission, prevents fraud. Well, you can't say prevents it because people still will try to fraud you. Provides fraud, theft, loss protection. Um, electronic payments are easier to audit and monitor. You can validate who's doing what at what time. Reduces uh, commuter cause traffic and pollution and that's because of telecommunicate uh, telecommuting you're not going to have people that are clogging up your highways and products and services are now going to be in remote areas poor choices like we were talking about perishable foods high cost or unique items you're not really wanting to sell those on electronic commerce um, you're seeing the perishable foods become more and more on there as the grocery stores are starting to come online and will bring stuff to you with a delivery charge of X amount of or percent of your uh, pr price. I mean, that's how they're going to start charging. Disadvantages will disappear when the electronic commerce continue, er, matures and it's out to the masses and everyone is generally accepting it. Additional problems. Calculating return on investment. It's kind of hard to see what you're how, you can see how much you're investing on it, but you can't really see the return on investment without doing both at the same time. Recruiting and retaining employees, technology and software issues, cultural differences, um, consumers resistant to change, and that's going away quicker than what you would think because more and more people are becoming adaptive to it. And it's not really a disadvantage, but what about the pizza tracker from Domino's? Will you order more pizza? Because you can see the processes that's going on. Was it worth their investment? The total cost a buyer and seller incur. Think about this. Anytime you buy something, you're incurring fees that the company doesn't want to pay, so they pass it on to you. 
Electronic Commerce makes that a lot easier, but also changes the vertical integration attractiveness, making it a lot easier to see and, and get to the individual item, and change the transactions cost. Instead of having to have the storefront, we'll have it at home. Employee transactions, telecommunications, may reduce or eliminate all transaction costs eventually. Neither a network of economic structures are neither market or hierarchy. They're partnerships. And the partnerships will coordinate strategies, resources, and skill sets. And this is going back to the EDI where you have Walmart with their suppliers. They've formed this alliance saying, okay, I'm always going to have you on my side with Procter & Gamble at Walmart. Going back and forth with them would be just amazing just to see how much they do. They come to those partners came together with a specific project or activity, and now they go back and forth all the time. Now let's talk a little bit about what dynamic SSL is. Well, what is it? In other words, when you pair with a secure cryptographic hardware device, such as a USB token or smart card, dynamic SSL acts as an SSL offloader. Instead of having the key negotiation take place on a personal computer, it occurs when the secure, uh, secure hardware device is attached to the computer. Pieces are securely uh, stored within that hardware itself, bypassing all endpoint vulnerabilities, and therefore cannot be intercepted or stolen. That's why you have that the chips on your credit cards now. Until it's hit on there, it's not going to ring anything up. It can't be stolen. Until you get smart and get a uh, smart car, uh, RFID reader if they put an RFID chips in there. Network organizations, they're well suited for information to intensive technology industries. Um, for example, a sweater. The knitters organize in networks of smaller organizations specialized in styles or designs. And then you order that style or design from those particular retailers instead of just a different, all of them from one area. Electronic commerce makes such networks easier to construct and maintain. And that's going to be more predominant uh, now than it will be or would have been 10 years ago. So here's what's going to happen. Market research firm sells the information. Customers buy that information. They sell the information to the sweater traders, sweater dealers, who then send it out to the clothes, who collect the market research. And that's how it goes, back in just in a circle. <laughs> Excuse me. Network effects. Activities yield less value as consumption amount increases. In other words, it's the law of diminishing returns. Adding more and more fertilizer improves the yield less and less. Networks. The exception of the law of diminishing returns. More people or organizations participate in the network. The value of the network to each participant increases. Telephone. If you're the only one with a phone, you have no value. But the more and more people that have phones, the better the value can occur. Email account example. I mean, if you only had the one email, you're not going to be able to do it. If you can, e email is just part of a smaller network, it's less valuable. But if it can connect out externally, you can have a lot bigger uh, effect. Internet email accounts versus just regular email accounts are more valuable to a single, than a single organizational email. You need a way to identify business processes. Evaluate electronic commerce suitability. When we're talking about identifying electronic commerce opportunities, what do you need to do? Well, you need to focus on a specific business process that you're looking at. What, what aspects are you trying to do? You can break down that uh, business process and then look at value-adding activities. Is this particular process adding to our company goals? If it's not, we need to look at it and refocus and, and restructure that particular part of the business. Commerce is connected by all businesses and all sizes. But let's talk about what is a firm. A firm is multiple business units owned by a common set of shareholders or a company. An industry is multiple firms. So Walmart is a firm. Okay, It has little small sections of its store. Uh, you have the food area, you have the clothing area, you have electronics area, sporting goods, automotive, um, health and beauty. Okay, th those are individual 
units. The firm would be Walmart. The industry would be retail industry. So if that kind of makes it a, a hierarchical structure for you. The value chain is organizing specific unit activities to design, produce, promote, market, deliver, and support those products and services. Um, human resource management and purchasing are part of those supporting activities that you also need to add into it. Strategic business unit uh, primary activities would be identify what the customer needs, design the purchase, purchase materials and supplies for those, manufacture a product or create service, market, sell, deliver, provide, after sell service and support. That kind of sound like a Best Buy to you? All that after sell, after market stuff. But how do they do this? Well, they come up with what they call a SWOT analysis. Their strengths, weakness, opportunities, and threats. Now, it's really what it is, is it is a, a block of four. Okay, you have two on the top, two, two rows, two columns. All right, strength and weaknesses. Those are going to be internal to your organizations, and your opportunities and threats are going to be external to your organization. First, we need to look into the internal part of the business, the strengths and weaknesses. What are our strengths and what are our weaknesses? Then we need to look on the operating environment or the outside. What are our opportunities and the threats that are presented to us? We need to take advantage of all those opportunities and avoid threats at all costs. We need to build upon our strengths and compensate for our weaknesses. That, and that's how you um, work on a uh, SWOT. Here's a SWOT analysis. Strength, weakness, opportunities, and threats. And then what you do is you would have your results of your... your uh, on the back side of those strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, opportunities, and threats, or your SWOT analysis. International nature of electronic commerce. It has become a global environment. So what are some of international commerce issues? Trust. Do we really trust those people that are on this other side of the globe that we cannot physically be with at all times? What about the culture? You know, you have to look at the different culture aspects of the different uh, people. Language. That's a huge barrier between um, co companies and the relations in the international environment. The government. For example, the, there's one issue it's called the bribe law here in the United States. It's illegal for a, anyone to bribe anyone to get a resource. In foreign countries, if Walmart needs to sell something over there, they may have to bribe the government and pay them so that the shipment can get down to the store. So how do we do this? And then the infrastructure. Do we really have that HVAC and the power that we really would need to operate these stores overseas? It's first, you need to identify and be able to find that trust barrier. Make sure that there's that integrity um, in the environment. It's difficult, difficult for online businesses because you don't know how well things are going to work out. Business must adapt to that local country. Think globally. Think, act locally. You want to make sure you expand globally, but you need to act locally to where your target is. Make sure that you have that local language or so they can actually uh, change the language. How many times you go to a site and all you see is in English? Or you can go to a site and all you see is in Japanese or Chinese or Mandarin. You need to drop down to be able to change it to any global language. Think of, look at Cisco, look at Dell, and see how many time, how many different languages they can write it in. Fifty percent of all internet content is in English. By 2015, seventy percent of e-commerce will involve at least one party outside of the United States, mainly India and China. Large site translation may be prohibitive. You don't. If you're a mom and pop shop, do you want to spend the money to have your website translated? Probably not. But if you're like Cisco or Dell, you better because you're going to get lawsuits if you don't. Mandatory translation into all supported languages. You need to have it on your homepage and first level links to any other homepage. High priority pages to translate. Um, if you're marketing or something, you want to make sure it's in the language easily understood for the individual to, to target them. For example, in 2001, there are 13 different languages in South Africa. 
So, are you going to look at the different languages? How are you going to make this happen? Cultural issues. You've got to have that element of business trust. You need to make sure you understand how they're going to interact with you in a certain type of environment. Because there may be personal property concept in North America and Europe, while it's it's personal property to us, you go to Asia, it's not. So there could be those type of aspects. Subtle language and, and cultural standards, you know. Um, General Motors Chevy Nova automobile. Baby food jars in Africa. If you say baby food, um, they're going to think, are you uh, selling babies in jars? And Africans judge content of the packaged food by the picture. So select your icons carefully. Shopping cart versus shopping baskets or trolleys. Remember, your hand signal for OK is an obscene gesture in Brazil. You don't want to offend the people you're trying to do. You don't want to... Um, you want to make sure that you use certain things over others. So look for those overtones. Online business apprehension. Japanese shoppers are unwilling to pay by credit. So is that a good thing for e-commerce there? Maybe not. It could be. SoftBank devised a way to introduce electronic payments to a reluctant Japanese population. You order online, then pick up and pay at a local 7-Eleven. Online discussion in inhospitable to cultural environments. Government controls culture like Chinese. China prohibits certain actions of certain sites from being there. Unfettered communication is not desired. Unfettered communication is considered acceptable. Unrestricted internet access is forbidden. Regularly reviews IP at, uh, ISPs and their records. Imposes language requirements. Internet censorship. Again, we're talking about China. How it's how we're trying to uh, help them understand that you can't censor or you shouldn't censor. But in their country, that's the way it is. Internet infrastructure. Computers and software is connected to the internet. Those networks send information traversing through packets that traverse the network to get to the other end. If you don't have that internet infrastructure, how do you expect to get the, the tools and to the individual users? Outside the uh, U.S., the infrastructure is government-owned and it's heavily regulated. High local telephone connection cost, and that also affects how the buyers can, uh, are they going to spend four or five hours on the internet because of their telephone company. International orders are a global problem. Businesses face challenges posed by variations and inadequacies of infrastructure supporting the internet and throughout the world. Freight forwarder ar arranges international transaction shipping and insurance. And customs broker arranges tariff payments and compliance with local and federal laws. You have bonded warehouse where you have a secure location. will hold Joe's, your international shipments until the customer requirements are paid or satisfied. And then handling international, trans uh, international transactions paperwork. Annual cost is about $800 billion. Software automates some of that paperwork, but you still have countries that have to have their own paper-based forms and procedures, or they have incom incompatible computer systems. So here's a typical party seller type environment where you have the, the seller sends out the domestic freight, the freight forwarder to the international freight, to the customs office, customs broker, back, and then it gets to the uh, bo uh, port warehouse, to the domestic freight carrier on the opposite end, the buyer pays, it goes to the buyer's bank, to the seller's bank, they release it, come back through, and then they can get their product. So in summary, electronic commerce is an application of new internet and web technologies. It is adopted in waves, just like everything else is, and the technology improves the products and services. And technology improvements improve purchasing and supplying, Identify new customers, often operate finance, 
in administration human resources management, reduce transactions, create new economic environments, and it fits into markets, hierarchies, and networks. We talked about value change. We talked about SWOT analysis. And be prepared to work on your SWATs, um, as I'm going to be setting up. Key international commerce issues, trust, culture, language, government, and infrastructure.